welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the first Sunday of Advent in year B. So we're back with Mark, new year and new season of the church year are Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. The psalm is 80, 1 through 7, and then 17 through 19. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 9. And as usual, some sort of apocalyptic discourse, Mark 13, 24 through 37. And so Advent always begins with that theme of apocalyptic realities and expectations. But first, happy Advent to all of our listeners out there, uh, and happy Advent to you, Matt, and you, Joy. Happy Advent to you and to all of our listeners. Yeah, it's it's a great, uh, great season. Great week. It's Matt's favorite church season. It is. It we is. We say that every year, but just in case somebody out there forgets. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can send Matt happy Advent greetings. You can. You also, everybody should know, uh, I have a new Advent one tradition that first week of Advent in recent years, I always make sure to watch Mad Max Fury Road oh, yeah. because I yeah. think it's, I think it's, uh, if Die Hard is the best Advent three movie, then I think Fury Road is the best Advent one movie. Ooh, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Great movie. <laughs> yeah. And Die Hard two might be the best Advent four movie. We have to think about that. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, good, good. But now we need an Advent two. I will work on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, have to, we have to think about that. We'll yeah. see if we can come up with that. All right, Mark thirteen twenty four through thirty seven is uh, again that familiar passage of keeping watch and uh, and that expectation or not expectation. We don't know what the time or the hour will be uh, when, when the time comes. So uh, that's how we begin Advent with some of those familiar themes of waiting and expectation and, and yet not being able to determine the time of of the coming. And so we keep awake and, uh, it, it's, you know, always a, an important entry into Advent in, 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 in those themes. And I think when you think about some of those themes that are introduced of particularly at this point, keeping wake, keeping awake or keeping watch, uh, what, what does that look like? How does that feel? What is that about? particularly this year? Is there some way that that theme gets embodied differently or preached differently because of where your congregation is at or where the world is at or where your, our nation is at? Uh, and so the way in which the preacher has a sense of what does keep awake mean this year, uh, if that becomes one of the themes that you take in, in, with this passage in particular? I wonder uh, if in a, a way of setting the reality that this is a text that we are familiar with and we really don't, don't know. Um, and to, to uh, take into consideration that we are living in times that seem like we can side them up with the uh, end times uh, that we read about in scripture. And while that seems to feel like a, a, an assignment of us, uh, certainty, in actuality, we really don't know. And playing with this not as a, this is a text that proves what will come next, but rather to living into that kind of expectation mode that is the season of Advent. And what does it mean to hear this knowing that those who heard it the first time were anticipating something, and we're 2,000 years later still in anticipation. And what does it mean for our listeners to take a posture of anticipation this season of Advent rather than a posture of certainty? I like that. 
a lot the idea of, of anticipation versus certainty that an anticipation you know still has a goal in sight right it still has a an expectation i think you know to answer your question caroline i'd i'd start with the, you know the opening verse here in those days after that suffering which then pushes us back into what's going on in verses 14 through 23 which appears to be talking about the uh the, the destruction of the temple and so i think in a way what what jesus is saying here in mark is or and what marks the gospel author is probably saying to the people reading it is don't conflate the the great war of 66 to 70 with a certain sign of the messiah's return that's that's a calamity jesus talks about but then at some time after then and you know then jesus himself says this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place so there is this sense of immediacy that's built into this which i think is built into a lot of the early churches expectation of jesus return and two thousand years later i think we're still trying to figure out what does it mean to see that time as elastic and to kind of recalibrate our sense of urgency and immediacy and to recognize the ways in which christian faith has i think dampened a lot of mark's apocalyptic uh oomph as one of my students recently called it that's kind of i don't know what that would be in greek probably probably it would be oomph uh but at the same time to recognize you can't live apocalyptically all the time you just can't do it without becoming i think a real danger to your neighbors so it's this it's this weird tension that i think christian faith asks of us to be in a posture of waiting but also to be urgent in that waiting and so that's the the hard part of this i think is to is to express that deep dissatisfaction that makes us long for something better but also a deep dissatisfaction of like how long oh lord and and to put this text out there and say we do this year after year after year after year why what are we uh what are we ritualizing in terms of kicking off the year with waiting um expectancy urgency and even dissatisfaction and just just to kind of talk about how we weave that into our lives together all of the time but in ways that also don't become what's the word i want that don't lead us into fanaticism or something that or just or an irresponsibility toward the world around us yeah that's uh, that's really interesting and in particular when you look at the details of verse 35 keep awake for you don't know when the master it's actually curious when the lord of the house will come uh in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn which is basically calling attention to all the times of the day. <laughs> so there's, so you're never not waiting. And I think that's one of the, or you're never not anticipating, or you're never not keeping awake. And of course, the irony is that, you know, in the next chapter, the disciples will fall asleep when they're asked to keep awake. And so they, they can't, um, they, they can't do that in that moment. And so there's something uh, really, uh, challenging then about this dynamic of, like you said, Matt, you can't keep that kind of posture on a daily basis. And particularly what, what Jesus is asking here, not just on a daily basis, but an hourly basis. So how do you think about, how do you think about that in just for this season? Uh, because we can't, you know, we can't keep this up for the right. <laughs> for the entirety of. <laughs> Which right. is exactly where Fury Road comes into my gospel reading. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, where Max says to Furiosa, "If you can't fix what's wrong, you'll go insane." Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you continue to live with this hope of a of a green place out there or something like that, while denying the. The, the daily violence that all the daily threats right it'll eventually mm -hmm. so we we need markers <laughs> we need reminders or sense or some kind of a sense that we're making progress i think but 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just no, yeah, no, that's a good. No, that's I'm perfect. eager to go cue up the film. Um, <laughs> we should note too uh, that these these four times that Jesus names in the verse you just read, those four watches of the night, are also all explicitly named in Mark's passion narrative. So as mm. the passion of Jesus starts to unfold, we will have reference to evening, midnight, cockcrow, and dawn from the point of the final meal up until uh, Jesus is brought before Pilate. So that's interesting that Mark seems to be mapping this onto the passion narrative. Next week, we'll get the baptism of Jesus. And I wonder how much Mark is also sees the baptism of Jesus marked onto or somehow uh, inscribed onto Jesus's death and the with the tearing of the veil and things like that. So in Mark's imagination, all of this stuff, I'm not sure it gets compressed, but it gets foreshadowed or somehow uh, lived out or dramatized or embodied in Jesus's death mm-hmm. also, mm-hmm. And, uh, which I think means we probably can't escape that death or that death remains the the most chilling portrait of this apocalyptic gospel of a Jesus who's going to break into this world and rearrange everything and defeat all of our enemies to use that apocalyptic language. And there's the hope that the suffering, uh, the tragedy, the trauma that is true, that has to be acknowledged is not the end Um, because not having the imagination for something different is also destructive. Should we go on to Isaiah? I guess so. Yeah. This it's always it's always hard. We should name that. I think this is always a hard passage, especially people coming off of Thanksgiving in the United States recently, or it's just it feels too yeah, feel people want to get into the Christmas mood. And so you've got this apocalyptic discourse out of Jesus' mouth. And so don't I guess don't run from it. Um but Isaiah won't really let you run from it either. So. Gonna say, you don't, you don't get to <laughs> You're do running that, out of texts. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and here's that that um a, a great uh irony in, in some ways that that shows up at the end of Isaiah. Um Isaiah opens with Israel in success and then transitions to that, uh, excuse me, Israel in failure, and then transitions to uh, Israel in in success, and then being called to accountability for their previous failures. It uh, then moves to uh, the promise that God hasn't forgotten. And um, if you keep that movement in line, Isaiah, this this text uh, does that same thing. It's a recognition that we don't recognize when God shows up and when God's not present, we call for God or we act like God doesn't exist. And that's a, a powerful claim um, for us to acknowledge uh, because ancient Israel wasn't always really good as a whole of acknowledging that. That's the work of the prophet uh, to say, we're not recognizing what God is doing. And that was that was the words that were given in the call to Isaiah. And that's where we are today. Matt, you transitioned us from Mark here in saying that, you know, this is, this is a difficult task. Well, speaking and not hearing, looking and not seeing, uh, going through all these experiences and not understanding is a different, difficult reality to be in. And these texts can be read to acknowledge that difficulty. I think too, with the with the, a Sunday like this, and uh, particularly Mark and the Isaiah text back to back or right next to each other, juxtaposed, it points out the fact that the coming of the Lord is not good news for everybody. <laughs> And so what is that, what is that, and we'll talk about that more next week, but what does that good news really mean? And, and because this, the commentator pointed out for the Isaiah passage, I mean, this is, this is the, 
you know, uh, calling attention to ripping open the cosmic, as um, Thea says, the barrier between realms and descend to be with people on earth. And that the immediate presence of God is, is serious business. I mean, you can't, there's no, uh, there's no really control of that, which is what the time, right? points to as well. We don't know the time, but it's not only not no control of time, but it's no, it's no control of how to manage that presence and what that presence is going to do in the world. And, uh, and that, uh, as we see in Mark's baptism too, but also here that, that, that ripping apart, right. Of the heavens, that tearing apart means that nothing can go back to the way it was before. And so, that both both of these passages side by side are, I think that's another homiletical edge that we might want to explore is that this anticipation, yes, it's for the birth of Jesus, but there's an edge to that. There's a there's a reality to that that's that some people might resist and say, well, that's a God that's too close. That's a God who knows way too much. Um, that's a God that has way too much access to me and uh, and and everything that I'm about, whether that and everything that we are about. And what is that going to then call attention to when when you have a, a God that that is that close? Yeah. And what does it mean? What does it actually mean when God is not that close? Um, because. Humanity's practices are, when God is close, to take that for granted and push God aside. And when God is absent, uh, as the text says, um, humanity sins. Humanity does what is wicked in the sight of the Lord, to, to use other texts. Um, uh, humanity does the exact opposite of what is expe expected. And circling back, and so God responds. God responds in anger and in disappointment um, because God's presence with us, that holiness is not going to be close to us in our transgression. And our, it is our transgression that pushes God aside. It is our turning away from God that makes God um, uh, not evident Um at, at least in our imaginations. And so the season of Advent of expecting that even now God will yet again um, uh, erupt in, in an eruption intrude on our lives, maybe not for everyone um, in, in what you know we anticipate when when Christ returns, but hopefully in, my neck of the woods, in my neighborhood, who needs to be reminded that there is a God who hasn't given up on us. For me, this season of Advent in the midst of trial has to be an expectation that God hasn't given up on us, even if we can't perceive it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I think this text also has us um nudging God as well <laughs> to remind to remind God that we haven't given up on God that I, I I really like what Thea says about the way in which the language of this kind of uh, this it, it's more than penitence here but there's an invocation an invitation taking place as well uh, and asking God to lament uh, as well so the the paragraph near the end of her of Thea's commentary, uh, to ask God to do the same, to lament, right? To rend God's own garment of the heavens, to cross the space between heaven and earth. Yes, to rip open the cosmic barrier, but also to bridge the chasm of hurt and silence, uh, to voice God's complaint, to ask God to, you know, to express God's own sorrow and even maybe God's remorse is uh, I th part of the Advent story as well, too. I think of urging God along, not just God ur you know, urging God to act, to come to my defense or to fix my life, but to, <laughs> to, to unleash that divine sorrow, that divine, um, what's the word I want, dissatisfaction with the world as it is, which I'm sure is a terrifying thing. But that's also, I think, part of what we're doing 
with hymns like come Emmanuel and all these other, you know, Adventy mm -hmm. things that we do in worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's risking an unknown future, right? It's what would happen if God unleashed God's own presence into the situation. Yeah. And if our imagination is all of our enemies would be smited and the world that we imagine would be, you know, uh, would be realized, we've probably misimagined that. So there's something deeply risky and scary about these Advent longings. I think that's my connection, my transition to the psalm, mm -hmm. because you you have repeated, let your face shine, let your face shine, let your face shine. What would that? What does that really mean? <laughs> What would that, that God's face would shine right uh, upon us and, and in all of its glory, but all of God's presence is, uh, first of all, it's a big ask <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and with some really um, serious results. And, and the question becomes, I think partly what Avin is about too is, where are we where are we kind of exploring in our hearts what it means to have as i was talking about earlier this full presence of god uh and what what difference is that going to make for our own lives and our own relationship with god and with jesus but with but also in our community and so i don't want to say consequences because that doesn't sound that doesn't sound very positive but uh, but are we, are we, do we spend time in our waiting, thinking about our readiness for that or preparedness for that? And, and, uh, and what will, what does that actually mean when we say, let your face shine? So, uh, and so that I would use the Psalm as in, in thinking about some of these thematic expressions maybe the the psalm that refrain becomes a part of uh part of your sermon of mm -hmm. let your face shine becomes another way to say you know render your garment O lord uh tear open the heavens O lord and uh and you know shine shine your light upon us shine your face upon us and then what is what is seen about us and then what is seen about god i think could be something a preacher could explore Corinthians? Or Corinthians? Well, go to Corinthians, and 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 uh, I, I'm trying to figure out why I'm having such a hard time getting into this psalm, uh, this uh, this this first su Sunday of Advent, and I think um, I think what I highlighted here is is how I've been reading all the other texts, um, and that is when when I'm reading this in terms of my prayer or my words, um, I don't think I can do that until I own my, uh, my sin, my transgression, my stepping away from God. And uh, admittedly, I'm not in a, in a local church context preaching week after week right now, like, like our preachers are. But if, if our communities have not acknowledged that God's anger at us is fair, then I'm not ready for us to say, how long are you going to be angry with, with us, God? Um, I think of a couple that um, went through, well, that he had an affair and she found out about it, but she didn't want to leave him. And I was shocked to find out that her, her describing the betrayal resulted in her saying, but I don't want to leave him. Do I have to leave him? And so that led to counseling where he said, and, and he was genuine. He was sorry. He was, sorry. it was a stupid mistake. It was really just a mistake. It wasn't like he wanted out of the relationship or anything. He he did a dumb thing and he came he had to clean, clean clean about it. He was genuine, but she couldn't just say okay. And he kept saying, 
why can't she believe me? And I said to him, because she trusted you for 15 years. And then you betrayed her. And now because you said, I won't do it again, you want her to forget the betrayal. And when he realized that it wasn't that she wasn't ever going to forgive him, but she needed him to understand that she had to build that up because of what he had done, that she couldn't just accept his, I need you back. She needed him to acknowledge, you wounded me. And when he came to recognize that, he was able to become the trustworthy husband again. And it didn't happen overnight with words. And I guess as I read this te these texts, uh, particularly as I look at Corinthians, where it's the happiest of the texts that we've read here, the greeting that says, um, you know, I give thanks to, to God because of um, moving further, uh, your testimony, excuse me, for, every, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind. Um, uh, it's verse seven I'm looking for. So that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus. And that's what for me Advent has to be is yes, we want God to, to forgive us. Yes, we want God to show God's face upon us again. Yes, we are being right again, but we have to wait because the situation we're in is because of our walking away, because of our not trusting God. I don't know if that makes sense. If I'm just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm worried about, <laughs> yeah, I don't want people to think that God's ability to forgive is like ours though. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. I just I don't want our pointing at God to be as if God's only role, I, I can't remember the exact words you used a moment ago, but it's God's only role is to restore us. You know, I think it was you, Caroline, that said, if we think that the return uh, of uh, the presence of Jesus is going to be our enemy striked. We're missing the point. And, and that's, I don't want that to be lost. I think one of the things about this passage that is, and the commentary talks about it, that, that, that too gets at some of the things that you're talking about, Joy and Matt, is that I, uh, the, the, presence of, and this is the irony, right? Or this is like that God is with us and strengthening us to the end, even though we're waiting for the presence of God. <laughs> so that, which is kind of you know, yeah. weird, uh, but uh, that, and that claim of God is faithful and that part of what we're entering into in the presence of God, as the text says, as Paul says, is this uh, being called into the fellowship of the son, Jesus Christ, this koinonia. Uh, and, uh, and so it, 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 and the t commentary talks about this, it's not just fellowship or partnership, but sharing in this intimacy. And so it the text offers a different kind of perspective than what we've been talking about in terms of what does that what does that presence of God mean um, in Jesus? And it means this, it means a lot of things, but it also means this sharing uh, in the fullness of 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 God in Jesus with our community. And uh, which calls attention to this this communal, and then we'll get to this later too in the text uh, with Advent. Advent, but we don't do this waiting alone. Um, we don't do this anticipation alone. We do it in community in anticipation of the ways in which God's presence uh, restores community and uh, and nurtures community and celebrates that fellowship that we have with Jesus. So it's a it's a you know, it's that slight, if you think about a kaleidoscope and you turn it this way, and all of a sudden you see some different aspects of, of about Advent 
and about this waiting time that uh, perhaps we haven't yet talked about in our podcasts.